Let's talk about the lives of stars. The lives of stars. Of course, stars aren't actually alive, but what happens to a star over its existence? Where does it come from? How does it change? What happens with that? All right, if we're going to do that, we'll, we'll find that there are a couple of different possibilities about uh, what's going to happen to a star um, and that different stars go through different phases in their life. The key characteristic that determines what's going to happen to a star over its life is the star's mass. The lives of stars. So this is determined, determined by mass. So that's that's a key idea here. Remember, all stars are made of basically the same stuff. They're about 70% hydrogen, about 30% helium, one or two or three percent of the other elements. They're all made of basically the same stuff. One or two or three percent varies, but in bulk, that's what they are. The main thing that determines what's going to happen to a star during its life is what its mass is. And so when a, when a star forms, well, okay, you don't make one star, you make hundreds, thousands, millions of stars at once. And so what you find out that it's all about the mass. Stars range in mass from somewhere around a tenth the mass of our sun up to 100 or 200 or maybe 300 times the mass of the sun. And then that's, that's the range. All stars are within that range. So it's all determined by mass, which varies from somewhere around 0.1 times the mass of the sun, uh, another number is 0.08 times the mass of the sun, roughly a tenth of the mass of the sun, up to to 100. I think right now the record, the biggest, most massive star detected is somewhere around uh, three, you know, 100 or somewhere around 300 times the mass of the sun. And this determines what they are. That, that sets the life of a star. So if I see a star just forming and I say, ooh, this is two times the mass of our sun, then I know what's going to happen to the star. So let's, let's start by looking at a low mass star. Let's look at our sun. Uh, our sun which is a low mass star. The vast majority of stars are low mass stars. These, you know, the smaller star, our sun is actually more massive than most. It's somewhere around 90% of stars are less massive than our sun. So these small low mass stars utterly dominate things. But those very rare high mass stars give off so much light that, that that's, they have a big effect on what we see. So anyway, we're doing our sun, a low mass star. Mass star. We've talked a little bit about how our sun formed, you know, the, the, the nebular theory of formation of the solar system. Well, you know, that's, that's what happens. You've got a big, great big spinning cloud of gas and dust, and today we can see this. We can see other solar systems in the process of forming right now. And so we find that they form disks, you know, they form disks of material, material mostly, again, all the time, most of the material is hydrogen, helium, gas, but then the other stuff is important. And then sometimes as the desk and gravity is pulling the stuff together, gravity pulls stuff to the center. The vast majority of the stuff falls in the center and becomes the, the sun, the star. Um, oftentimes you'll have jets going up. So, okay, a disk is a two-dimensional structure. So if things are flowing in towards the star, spiraling to, in towards the star along the disk, that means the top and bottom are open. And the stars where things are, the, the protostars where things are going to get really hot. And so often we find jets of hot material coming out above and below the disk. Uh, often with jets because disk is two-dimensional, the top and bottom are open, so you're going to get jets and stuff, and magnetism may be involved in this in interesting and complex sort of ways. And so as it's forming, energy, energy just comes from compression. If you take a gas and you compress it, it gets hotter. So that's the main source of energy. Well, we have, so energy is from gas compression, so this takes place when you have a, so this is what we call a protostar. And then, okay, so the, it compresses material and at the center the stuff gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter and hotter and denser and denser and hotter until finally you reach that magic temperature at which you can trigger nuclear fusion reactions somewhere around 15 million Kelvin, something like that, and then it becomes a star. That's the transition point from being a protostar to a star. So energy comes from gas compression, you know, you're a protostar, and then nuclear reactions start, nuclear reactions. And then, you know, nuclear reactions turning hydrogen into helium. And then that's when you become a star. A star is born, is born. 
Okay, so this happens. Now the vast majority of a star's life, so the star is born, and you know it's using up hydrogen, its core is turning from hydrogen to helium, but during most of a star's lifetime, it's an amazingly stable object. So a star is born, it's burning hydrogen to helium, so it's going to appear on the main sequence. So here's, you know, here we've got uh, luminosity, here we've got temperature, here we've got hot, here we've got cool, and so we've got this, you know, this, this, this bending sort of thing. So here's the main sequence. There's all these stars around here. So where you are in the main sequence is totally determined by your mass. So you go plop down right there. This is your temperature. This is your luminosity. And they sit on the main sequence. And these change for a these do not change for a remarkably long period of time. Our, our sun has a probably total main sequence lifetime somewhere around 10 billion years. And throughout that time period, um, its, its luminosity, its surface temperature change very, very very little. It is a remarkably stable thing. Even though the core is shifting, it's becoming more and more helium, and so the, 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 the fusion, well, that becomes a problem as you start running out of the hydrogen, but as a result of that, the, kind of, the core kind of compensates, and it, it's very stable on the main sequence. So, the store is born, it's on the main sequence, it has very, I mean, it does change a little bit. Our, our sun started out a um, uh, little bit less luminous, and it's slowly grown a little bit more luminous over time. But when you're talking about billions of years, and it's changed by a few percent, I mean, that's what we're talking. So it is very stable for a long time, for a long Time. Our sun has probably changed in luminosity and surface temperature by you know a few percent, maybe five or ten percent over four and a half billion years. That's amazing. Okay, and so this happens as long as it's burning its hydrogen into helium in its core, and then what happens? It's going to get a core of pure helium, and then that changes things. So that's the so so if, we, if we're listing out the stages in the in the life of a low mass star like our sun. First, it's a protostar. Second, it's a main sequence star, which is therefore the vast majority of its existence. But then, the core is now pure helium. Can't burn helium into you know, well, you can't burn hydrogen to helium when you don't have any hydrogen. So it's going to be helium for so it's got this core of pure helium. And so what happens is, but but surrounding the helium, you still have a shell shell of hydrogen, hydrogen, and so it burns in kind of a shell around the core. The core is now inert. It's not doing any burning, but you've got some fusion around that, and so that causes the star to go a little bit unstable. So now it leaves the main sequence, and it goes up here. It gets cooler at the surface, hotter in the core, and more luminous, more luminous. It's now, you know, it burns in the shell, and that dumps more of its helium ash into the core, and that compresses it more, and so the core is now getting hotter. Up until this point, the core was locked in at 15 million kelvins, and now, now it's doing this, it's become a red giant. Red giant. And we see these red giant stars. That's how they work. Um, and then, so this is going to happen as that core gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it gets more and more unstable and moves far and far off the main sequence until the core gets hot enough that it can now burn helium, and it can actually do fusion with helium. And so then, you know, so now the core temperature is up somewhere around 100 million, 100 million Kelvin. Remember, hydrogen fusion is somewhere around 15 million Kelvin, so it's way, way, way hotter now. Now it's up to 100 million Kelvin, and now it can do helium fusion. It burns three, he fuses three helium atoms together to make a carbon. And this causes the, the star to kind of calm down a little bit. It becomes a new, there's a, there's, a, there's a little spike off the main sequence here. This is where it becomes what we call a horizontal branch star. Horizontal branch star. And now it is doing, a horizontal branch star is doing helium fusion in its core. And so it settles down. It's kind of nice for a while. But then, okay, and, and you know, so, so when it and, when it becomes a red giant that first time, it swells up big. When our sun does that, it will gobble up the planets Mercury and Venus. It is that it will be that large. So you know, it, it swells up huge. Its core gets hotter, but its surface is getting cooler. So that's why it's a red giant. Then it ignites the helium, and then it all kind of calms down again. It shrinks back down. It becomes a horizontal branch star. Um, while it was that big, it would have you know burned away the Earth's atmosphere and boiled away the ocean. So we'd all be dead. But as we're going on with that, the interesting thing is now that it's settled back down again, and it becomes this horizontal branch star, and it burns helium into carbon until it runs out of helium to burn, and now it has a core of pure carbon. And so now basically it does the same thing again. Now it burns carbon helium in a shell around that, 
And so it kind of comes up here again, and it becomes a red giant a second time. Our sun will be a red giant twice. Once when it's burning hydrogen in a shell around an inert core of helium, and then once when it's burning helium uh, around an inert core of carbon. And then we'll go up here, and so it'll become a red giant again. This time it gets so large it will be able to reach out to the Earth's orbit, and probably as it's interacting, the Earth will be just barely skimming the edge of that, so that will cause the Earth to spiral in and be vaporized. And as it does that, then it's like, well, can it get hot enough to do um, fusion with carbon? No, uh, it will not. So our sun cannot do that. And so as a result, it can do fusion all the way up. It can burn up and make up a core of pure carbon, and that's the end of it. So um, what the, the, the thing that stops it is that the, in order to do more fusion, it would have to compress the core more, make it smaller and hotter and smaller and hotter and smaller and hotter. And the reason it can't do that is because it turns out there's this thing called electron degeneracy pressure. The electron degeneracy pressure pressure this comes from the quantum theory quantum mechanics each electron needs a certain amount of space in order to be an electron and so this causes a pressure that prevents the core from collapsing inward anymore so what happens electron degeneracy stops the collapse and it balances out the core and so now you have this core of carbon uh, surrounded by some helium and it's surrounded by some hydrogen, and so what happens now is the outer layers of the star, but it, it can't do any more nuclear fusion. Fusion is done. It's not going to do any more energy generation. So the outer layers are blown out into space, out to space, uh, during the kind of the end of the red giant phase, you know, the, the, the star, the sun swells up so enormously huge, you know, it's engulfed the earth, and so these outer layers are pushed back out into space by, by, by a strong wind, and um, basically these outer layers ultimately are going to be recycled into the next generation of stars. They create an object called a planetary nebula, it has nothing to do with planets, Nebula, it's just like a, when we see these, a big round glowing bubble of hot gas in space. We can see these with our telescopes. Uh, so that, and then at the very, and then the, this leftover core of the star is left over there. Leftover core, leftover core of carbon. It is inert, no fusion, inert, inert, no fusion. Uh, that's it. And so we call this thing, once, once you build up this, this, this leftover core of the star, it's about the size of the Earth, even though it's a substantial fraction of the mass of the Sun, and we call these, and we see these things, this leftover core of carbon, this is called a white dwarf. White dwarf. And we see these. We see white dwarf stars. They're the leftover cores of low mass stars that are held up by electron degeneracy pressure, and they're there, and that's it. And so then they sit there and then they cool for very, very long periods of time. Sometimes you can have interesting things if there's a binary system and this can throw stuff on top of the white dwarf and you can get flares up and nova and stuff like that. But, but for the most of them, that's the end of the line. It's this leftover ember of carbon. And that's the, and then it just sits there and cools basically forever. It's a white dwarf because white, it's hot, really hot. It's the leftover core of a star. But it's tiny, so it's a dwarf, and it has low luminosity, very hard to see, and it just sits there and cools and cools, and eventually it would disappear, it would become a black dwarf, but we can't see those because they don't give off light. And so that's how our sun will ultimately die.